in the United States Marine Corps. And what war? World War II in the Pacific. And what was your rank? Uh, well, I, I was worked up the corporal. Mike, were you drafted or did you enlist? Um, I was on, uh, I was signed a draft, but I, uh, I chose the Marine Corps. I guess they was enlisted in the... Uh, yeah. Do you remember the date? Uh, the, the, I would put down uh, September 1st, 1943. Where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living in uh, Keysville, New York. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Well, I, uh, I, guess, I guess if I was going to fight, I might as well fight with the best of them. Uh, but I also had uh, three brothers ahead of me that were in the two in the Air Force and one in the infantry army. And that may have may have had a little effect on it. Do you recall your first days in service? I recall them right all over the real well. Yeah. Will you describe that for me? Well, uh, I think I'll uh, start. I got in the train in Albany, New York. That was for your basic training? To head for Paris Island, South Carolina. And it was a, we were there at Albany at, uh, in the morning, and we were on, the, we got to New York City and changed over from, uh, I don't know which weather, it was the Grand Central and uh, to, you got the and Pennsylvania Station to switch in order to go head for Washington, D.C. In D.C., we uh, traveled all that night, uh, crowded in the train. It was just packed, crowded in there, and uh, all the way down to, uh, well, Buford, uh, South Carolina. That was the landing spot. In those days, in 19... 43, the, the train pushed us to all the cars all the way from uh, New Bern, I guess, New Bern, North Carolina, all the way to, uh, down to the, uh, to the Paris Island. I, I remember uh, the train whistle blowing at night and we were going down to it, it was a hollow sound. And uh, in those days, uh, it was every once in a while you would see a little light. There were kerosene um, lamps that the the blacks lived in down in that section down there. We didn't know where we, what we were going to find down there. It was it was the worst place in hell. I mean, uh, yeah. And, and you ended up at Paris Island. I ended up at, uh, on the shore, and uh, we got off the train, and at the time we got off the train, a barge was pulling in, the, it was just a, uh, it was just a barge, and all the recruits that were ahead of us got up, and they started looking at us when their civilian clothes, and you'll be sorry, <laughs> and, and uh, I see a little guy in there with a smile. And I said, "If he can survive, I can too." But I was, I was sorry at first, but then I was glad. That I, once I got a handle on what I was going to be up to, once I got a, well, we got, got on the barge, and it's, it was only about a 10-minute trip up to Paris Island. And from then on, it was, it was I was in their hands. The sergeant was. Uh, Received us, introduced us. <laughs> he would be the the uh, uh, platoon sergeant, 
he would be telling you when when to sleep, when to eat, when to everything. You'll be told what to do. And that lasted 13 weeks. But but the sergeant was doing it all for us. I could uh, the, when I left, I wasn't sorry one bit. In fact, I had the pleasure of meeting him twice later. Do you remember his name? Yes, Sergeant Joe Haggerty from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was a policeman when he came into Rica. We met. Uh, I met him, and I was able to do him a favor uh, when he uh, when I was at Paris Island. I later was transferred to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and uh, he was coming through to uh, training uh, and getting ready to go overseas. And uh, at Camp Lejeune, we, uh, we had a little, uh, what we call a slop shoot. That was a beer, a beer hall there. And he, uh, I recognized them. Uh, and, uh, and, well, he sees so many of them. But anyway, after we talked a little while, he said to uh, I, he said to me, "Do you have any more of your khaki shirts?" And I said, "But oh well, yeah, yeah." He said, "The slop shoot down there. We can't get in there unless we have a khaki shirt." And I said, well, "I uh, give him the slop." And I said, "Well, I'll go with you tonight." And so we went down. We spent about three hours down there. We got real friendly. And, and uh, one night uh, in Okinawa, when I was back off the front lines, uh, I met him again. And, Joe Haggerty, but we knew each other good then. Yeah. And he had moved from a uh, from his sergeant to um, he had two new stripes of a gunnery sergeant. He did. Yeah. Yeah. What were your 13 weeks in Paris Island? What kind of things did you do? Well, we started off the uh, go in the shower first. You would get your hair cut. And they're fast, and it costs you a quarter, and that will be taken out of your first month pay, 25 cents. And they were all civilian barbers. You get your hair cut down about a half inch on top. Then you go into a, a shower, you're, uh, and when you come out, there's a set of clothes for you to, to wear. They're waiting for you, and you get in there. And then we came out all together, gathered in a group again. And we had a talk. Uh, we had a group of old timers, and uh, well, it, it have to be an old timer. It was uh, one of the sergeants that was on there was uh, Lou Diamond, one of the greatest mortar men the Marine Corps ever had. They claimed he could uh, fire a, a mortar gun and drop a uh, and within three shots. He could put one of the uh, one down the chimney, <laughs> but that was that was the old timer then. But we were uh, talked to and what to expect, and, uh, and uh, then from there, it was one thing after the other. You got clothes, and, uh, everything. Then you started to that everything is going to be done done by the numbers. You're going to be uh, when you're marching. It's one, two, three, four, but they. He uh, hop it up like then. So you're doing there. There's going to be four numbers: left, right, left, right, left, right. And then you go and get the training. And the training was to that sergeant. When he got done with us, he could march us across the field, bust us all up, put us back together, and uh, and uh, he had us right by the on the end of his finger there, like and. Uh, even today, I could uh, think I could, uh, with a little practice, about five minutes, I'd be able to. Uh, if, yeah, yeah. You'll come uh, every, when you, every time you you fall out. If you come out of the barracks, the order was fall out, and you were gathered in a group, and you knew how to get in there. You use the. Uh, I was a squad leader. You had six. 60 men uh, in the platoon, and then in, in two parts, and you have a platoon, lead, uh, platoon leader at the head each time. 
to what the he-, he is, he gets his position, he marks off, and taps the guy beside you by the, on the shoulder. And that's the distance to keep you apart. And uh, then uh, that, that's what uh, dress right is a command to get them dress right. And you measure off, and then you pull, and then they call that attention. You call your slap your feet together on, on the side. And then he gives you the first command where uh, to uh, if you have no weapons but just marching, he'll give you attention and uh, he gives you either where you're going to go. If, if you're going to go to the left, and then the command is uh, left. Let's see. Well, let's see if it's. Uh, left anyway that's the word and then you turn left and then if he gives you step off he gives you forward you start off on your left foot and everyone steps off and if you're out of the line you can very easily hurry shuffle your feet and you can get back in the line all right so but you by the end you're uh, like you'd say to him your other left <laughs> That's all I, we have to. Basic, that's all you have to learn in basic? I'll, I'll, no, no. No, no, after, uh, during the, uh, during that time, you learn the history of the Marine Corps. Then you have a red, it was a red book. You were issued that book and you read it because it's going to be very important because your first test to get your first stripe comes out of that book. So, uh, uh, that's when I got when I graduated out of boot camp. I got a, my first stripe. When you have one stripe, what's your rank then? The uh, private first class. Yeah. And uh, then, when you're uh, pretty well lined up, you're uh, you, you by then about eight or nine weeks. Nine weeks after, by that time, you've already worn out one pair of shoes. <laughs> from marching, so you can get an idea of all the marching we did. Even the rifle range was three miles away from the main station, all the way, well, rifle shooting. We ran out there, and it was, like, you go out, uh, what the command was, was a forced march. In other words, you it's to get, get to one place to the other the fastest way possible. So you're Walking and running, walking and running, and you you just keep up. You don't sit down and rest. You run that whole three miles out there, and by the eighth week, you're in pretty good shape then. So, yeah, yeah. At the rifle range, you're put into a, uh, uh, just before you go out there, you're issued a rifle. And uh, what you do, uh, the rifle is all full of grease, and what they call cosmolot. Cosmoline. It's uh, done in the factory. Now you have an instructor, which later I became one on the rifle range to an instructor, to show you, tell you what you've got to do. You've got to clean that all up. You've got all the rags and things to clean it, and you're given a, a rod and a, with a little piece of uh, uh, cloth that you used to put it into a cleaning solution and to take the oil out of the ore. So when you get through with this whole thing, you, the, the gun is in top-notch shape, real sparkling almost. I think. Now, now you, well that, before you go to the range, you, you learn to march with the rifle. There was another part, about a week's training, and then that one there is uh, many of the commands well, uh, First one, when you got the rifle now, other the commands got to, is based on with the rifle. You're pulled out of attention, and you have a rifle. Uh, first out, uh, first you assemble, and then you're called to attention, and then you're uh, given a command, parade rest. And at that point, you spread your legs, and you, your rifle is out straight on, on your arm like this. Now he gives a command of attention, you pull the rifle back up here and you snap your two heels together 
And then uh, the next command is uh, uh, port arms. Pull the rifle up, catch it by the upper stock, grab it here, and you pull it to your chest like this. And uh, that's the next command. And then, uh, then if you're going to start to march, you get your command left or right. Then they say, uh, then port uh, right shoulder arm. With that one there, you bring your rifle. You got the, you got the butt of the rifle right here in you, and you uh, put it on your right shoulder. Then you can be given a command left shoulder arm. Left shoulder is the start of the command. Then when he gives arm, you slap it back over and you go out this way and you get it on the left. And you got to be an expert on all that. Uh, and, uh, uh, then you're head up with a rifle range. You ran that, run that three miles, and then you're in a barracks out there, and uh, you go, go to your meals. All your meals, you're pulled out, told what to do, fall in chow time, and you've got so much time to get it all done, you're back out again, and, and uh, there's, uh, you got a little rested. Those days, uh, they let you smoke. No, they, you could smoke. Cigarettes were cheap anyway. You could have probably five minutes. I, I, uh, I started smoking when I got in there because they were cheap to use and everybody was smoking. And, uh, but I, like, I was lucky uh, I quit before I left the Marine Corps. So I've never smoked since. Well, so what, is, what happens at the end of the 13 weeks when you graduated? Well, okay, okay. Uh, when you, you go, uh, what, what you do first, you know, you've got your rifle that's clean, spotless. Then you assemble out in the field. Um, I may have a picture of uh, another guy I knew with a, oh yes, I will have a little pictures of the rifle range, uh, what they did, because they don't do that today. Ours was different, but I like their, what they're doing today better. I, but we, uh, with the rifle now, we have to fire, uh, fire the rifle offhand, that's standing, offhand, then you, then you have to fire it sitting and that's where you're sitting on your heel like here if you can, and uh, then you have kneeling, those three positions. Now, in order to get there, you've got to do stretch the muscle. Now, you've got to sling on the rifle, and it has to be adjusted right on your arm to hold it, so that rifle just, you just won't bounce it. With. But you've got to be doing it, what they call snapping in. That's the order, that's what it's snapping in. And so we go through Oh, probably an hour or two a day, and but if you want to uh, be an expert rifleman, do a lot of practice at night when you got the time off. And you got it. so we used to go out in the field and uh, while we're at the rifle range and uh, snapping in, and then the snapping in the other one is this uh, snapping in is a, I call it a dummy run. You fire your rifle on an empty chamber and it doesn't do any damage but you learn to squeeze the trigger you don't pull it or you know well, everyone has some on it but as a coach later on I, I see all that uh, why we have to do it better see a better picture but it, each one helps each other I, the way I like about the whole whole Marine Corps there's something at the end of the trail that why you were given that stuff there. So you learn that. Uh, and uh, why I did it is I just, just, I liked it. I used to go out in, in the night, uh, I mean, at, at, when I'm at night rather than uh, reading a book or something, go out and snap in it. It shows up. I uh, was an expert rifleman. My, my uh, discharge verified that. And not only that, I got five dollars more a month for that, for being an expert. And the medal you got. Yeah. Did they train you to be a rifleman, or did everybody get the same rifle? Right you got the same thing, but uh, coaches, which I later became, your coach takes over. The, 
the uh, drill sergeant likes that. He gets a little break. He marches us down to the firing line. It's 500 yards. We start uh, firing at a target 24 inches. In other words, 24 inches like that. At fifth, uh, 500 yards, it looks like just a baseball. And that's what you're shooting in there. And um, I pride myself. I Every time I did there, I was getting on eight out of eight when I was firing eight shots. That's only in the prone position. That's lying, uh, lying down. That's why I didn't say anything about the prone. That was the only time you uh, fire in a prone position is uh, 500 yards. And you fire a single shot. That's to train you for uh, sniper shooting. But our combat, the combat that I saw, was a whole different thing by the time I got there. Out, uh, the enemy we were fighting was the Japanese. Uh, and we had to dig them out of holes. That's all. Uh, it wasn't uh, sniper uh, training I got. I didn't need it. Where did you go from uh, Paris Island? Paris Island, I was... Uh, I took, had a 10-day furlough to go home, and I was directed to come back uh, to the rifle range. I agreed to before that they asked me if I would like to be a coach, and I, uh, I agreed to it. So then when I came back from my furlough, I was uh, taken to the main station, and then this time I rode out to the rifle range. <laughs> The you were back at the same rifle range on Paris yeah. Island now? Yeah, I got pictures of the, uh, uh, of a little, you'll get an idea of a little bit, uh, well, good, good idea of it. So then you coached the new recruits and how to shoot the rifle? That's right. I went there and on the cleaning and the snapping in and telling them what to do and you and the uh, the tricks of the trade. And a, lot of, a lot of kids will go up and they will... Uh, because it gets a kick, and there are uh, there's some of them are a little small, you know. They, yeah. But I had fired rifles before I went into the service anyway. Uh, my brother's shotgun used to kick like that, you know. And some, so what you get a habit of bucking, you throw your shoulder into it, and you, you hit the, um, in the dirt. You know, you don't shoot that uh, when you like that. <laughs> Instead of the target, you so what you do is, uh, what the trick we had, we had a, a little gadget, about two inches like that, with little mirror, two mirrors inside, and you could snap that on over the sight that the, the recruit looks through, and you can tell where he's looking. And then if you know, the two mistakes is usually bucking, and the other mistake is uh, trying to... Uh, to uh, cheap because you don't want to buy, obviously a few of them don't want to go any further. They want to get out of the service or get out. Get. So you put that on there and you'll see where he's shooting. You tell him now squeeze, squeeze, squeeze and, it, and I know just where he's going to hit. If he's aiming down low I'll, I'll see it. And then I take a, uh, I tell him in no uncertain terms what I'm going to do and uh, then uh, another one is to uh, to put, take the bullet off the end, break one off, dump the powder, slip it into the chamber, stand over him where he can't see, and you, uh, you slip it in there. Now he's going to fire, and it's like firing a cap gun. It doesn't kick at all. And if he's throwing his shoulder, he'll do it. And you usually break them out of habit. It doesn't take you very long. But a little speech, you give them a little sermon, too, you know. <laughs> How long did you coach at the rifle range? I stayed there. I agreed to six months. And I stayed there. And uh, I enjoyed it. But uh, the turnover, a lot, of people, a lot of them, we were, uh, a major mo was our commanding officer out there, and he gathered a group of us that were going to be coaches. And he said, I won't hold you to it. I'd like to have you stay six months, but if you can't take it, you know, feel free to, uh, to uh, sign to get to go off to, up to Camp Lejeune. 
And so, uh, you know, I stayed my full six months. And, uh, and then once again, my service records showed that after two months, that was the highest dropout rate that I went by the two. And that was the only lowest rate I got in my service. They had a total of, uh, of five for uh, the best rate, and I got four eight for that. And after two months, I noticed that it went up to five for the other four months. Yeah. Where did you go after your six months? I went to uh, Camp Lejeune Rifle Range, and I met some guys I knew. I mean, we had every time a group would come up there anyway, you'd find somebody you know. And uh, there I went into... Uh, training for sniper shooting, uh, real co combat under machine gun fire, crawling uh, on your elbows with your rifle, uh, went going through uh, all kinds of combat training, that, that, uh, that real experience. And then we took over from the trainees and they went on to their various outfits. How long did you stay at Camp Lejeune? I stayed till I... Uh, Almost, uh, that was in uh, almost six months, but under the heavy training, I was going through a, a thyroid condition. My neck started swelling up, and my thyroid was pressing my windpipe, and I, I was told to go, go to the, turn yourself in because I, my, my neck was getting too big for my shirt. But, uh, so they uh, sent me right immediately right down to the ho uh, to a hospital in Cherry Point, a Navy hospital. Navy, uh, uh, still today I guess uh, Navy is still a part of the Marine Corps. I mean uh, the other way around, uh, the Marine Corps was a part of the Navy. Yeah, but I don't know what they do now. Anyway, I went to the hospital and, and the doctor, but uh, Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham uh, talked to me and uh, got two other doctors and said they, they need an operation. Gotta have and uh, they said, you don't have to have it, but if you don't, then we'll have to discharge you because you're not. But we'll do everything we can to put you right in top shape. You know? And I said, well, if I'm going to have it, I better have it here. Now, I, so I have no idea what I want to go get discharged. No, I don't want to go back at the home, you know. And that's almost as a bad, uh, as a bad conduct discharge to be discharged. You know. And uh, I think my father would have uh, crucified me if I would ever get back. And uh, anyway, the opera operation was good. Dr. Graham and the two doctors uh, talked to me and uh, laid, it, laid it level right with me and and uh, I agreed to it, and I did it. And so I got separated from my group. In the meantime, this group that we were doing, we were preparing for the big war going into Japan. But we still had some other ones. So, but I was able to get back in my old outfit. But uh, I stayed in the hospital about six weeks. And then I was uh, uh, with a group, and I didn't know anybody, and it was all training. I went to Camp Pendleton. Where's Camp Pendleton? At Camp Pendleton in California. And it's uh, still a, a big place out there, yeah. And we did some other training uh, while we were there. We were My outfit that I was in was in Guadalcanal. We got, I got sidetracked up here, and I got, took advantage of, the, of some training of a jumping ship that involves swimming with a full pack on, uh, survivor. How would you get off of a boat? We, it was a 30-foot tower. You had your full pack on your back, and you jumped down into the water. Just step off when you're, you had to look straight and boom, down you go. And then swim 50 yards. That was an estimate it'd be you know, swim, you know. That was a good training for it. Uh, and uh, there wasn't much other to do because we were, uh, they were coordinating the, the other thing. They were getting down the canal, preparing to go into Okinawa. 
so that my what happened to me I uh, got got uh, transferred then into the first uh, regiment draft that that was the we were in a draft to replace casualties the first draft so this I didn't get into the north part of the uh, north of North Okinawa that was a two week uh, uh, operation and uh, I didn't get in until uh, they come down, uh, cleared the north, and then it began the battle of going south. Uh, that's where all the activity was. So then you got actually shipped over to Okinawa? Yep. I was, you know where you landed in Okinawa? Yeah, it was, I landed on um, Green Beach and uh, right near Yonkon Airport, where they previously uh, first uh, group landed. That was in the middle of it, right straight in the middle. The island was chopped up into six division, first uh, Marine uh, Regiment and uh, Tenth Army, and they were. We were on. If you uh, if you look at it as you look at it on to the left, that would be the western part. Uh, that was uh, the sixth division, and the next one was uh, in the middle. And then on the eastern shore was the uh, 10th Army. You were in the 1st Regiment. First. Do you remember what date it was, what month in year? The day I was in there, my record shows, uh, I think I didn't get down there till about the 20th, 20th of April. They landed on uh, uh, Easter Sunday, the full division, landed on Okinawa uh, April 1st, 1945. And so it was 1945 when you were I didn't land. I was in the first regiment in trap. That was we were held back to uh, Guam, which was about a day and a half away to come up when we came up to fill in after they captured the North End. So it was 1945. Yep. And uh, this this one here, uh, this this was the this, the bloodiest battle in the Marine Corps ever fought. There was, and it doesn't. There's uh, uh, not that there's some history on it, but there's uh, the, all the Navy. There was 1,100 ships out. There was just an ocean of ships out there when we had landed on the shore. There, it's, it's hard to believe that the, all those ships in there, and all of the Navy men that got killed, and ships were sunk in there. But they don't get the I imagine you can get some history of that there. Somebody's got it. The Navy has got it there. But the Navy took an awful beating. A lot of, a lot of ships were sunk. Um, we came in on the, um, no, we went down to rope ladders. That was glad I had that training. And, uh, you came down the rope ladders off the ship? Yeah. And you got into shore? And you got into a, um, uh, a Higgins boat. This is a landing craft. They're um, what they call it. There's two types of landing troop landings. A small troops is a, a Amtrak. That's an amphibious track that goes in water and land. And um, it was the Amtraks we got into. So we got in there, and then when we hit the shore, they drove right up on the beach, and the front opened up, and you walked got out. Well, it was getting organized. Uh, <coughs> uh, first night, it was, it was raining, pouring rain. Anyway, I saw when we were coming up in the ship, uh, it was all clouds over there anyway, and pouring rain. Oh, I laid in the foxhole that night. I got, we got assembled. We were in the foxhole, and I had a shelter hat and a poncho. And when I woke, got up out of there, I didn't sleep at all. I was... Uh, Few bombs going off a little good when they were away from us. Uh, in the morning, all my hands were wrinkled. And boy, that was was I glad to get in that truck when we moved up, going up the front lines. I, going up the front lines was oh mud that deep. And, and the, why you have to see these things off to see uh, to really uh, tell you what a, what a ride. 
sitting on a board there. <laughs> so that very next morning they took you up to the front line? Well, yeah, but the sad part was my close buddy in, from boot camp, Ed Van Order from Syracuse, Syracuse well, he graduated. Uh, I have a picture of him. He and I have cups of uh, a few pictures of Ed. And uh, we were, I don't know what time, it didn't matter too much, but I, one guy recognized me from back in the, the States so as a coach. And he hollered, hey, Bush, I got your buddy in here. And I said, who? He said, Van Order. I knew it was the, well, they call it the meat wagon. They bring in the dead off the lines. To, and uh, he was the first guy I was going to go back and see him. He, I wouldn't have got in the same company, but I might have got to see him again. But on that, that time there, he got killed about uh, uh, two or three days ahead until uh, I got up there. I mean, I don't know that. But all I mean is that, and that's the first shock I got. Yeah, that one there, uh, I never got over that one very much because he got a dirty deal. And I think that for some reason or other, that. I'll be telling you some more on the, the dirty, what I call the dirty deal that uh, he paid too much. You know, he he was a all-star tackle at Cornell University in 1942, and he was promised or agreed to a commission in the Navy when he graduated out of 1940, in 1943 out of Cornell University, and he. They didn't say anything to him about medical report. And when he got there, he had high blood pressure, and he was classified. And couldn't take him. Not with him. So he wanted to go to the, in the war anyway. So he said, "I might as well go in just like mine. You're going to fight five of the best." And he joined uh, at uh, Albany, New York. So he left at Albany. Uh, I didn't know him then, but he was there with and they. Gang. Anyway, from what he said there, uh, so uh, he was very disappointed that he got into the Marine Corps. They took him with high blood pressure. He was, but they didn't want officers with high blood pressure. And he got a, um, he shot high expert too. He was a coach, and we were together uh, there and uh, together at Camp Lejeune, and then we separated. And then uh, I was following the news and everything, the little news we would get. So I never did get to see him again. And uh, I felt bad for him because uh, uh, if he could fight for the Marines, he ought to be able to fight there. Anyway. Yeah. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to get off the track, but uh, that's going up the line. Of it, so I didn't. And the only other time uh, I've got a all through the battle, you know, you get a good shock. Someone, I, I believe, I'm no different than anybody else. Uh, the first time uh, it, 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 it didn't happen, but when I was told to fix bayonets, I got the order from the sergeant. We was up in the front lines, and uh, they expect the Banzai attack that night, and we were sent out on an advanced outpost. We would take the shock of the, any group that would, we were. There was four of them, four foxholes. There was four of them, four in each of one of them. And uh, and then the sergeant before we went up, he says, "I'm going to give the order: fix bayonets." <laughs> the chills went up my back, and I and I uh, got settled down all right when we got into Boston. I didn't sleep at all all that night. I, all four of us, but none of us slept that. We were, but nothing happened. When you were, then you went up to the front lines. Did you see combat on the front lines? Oh, yeah, that was right all. Right on Okinawa. How yeah. long did you have to stay up there? Uh, about five days, and then uh, we accomplished four to five days. What uh, We fought a battle that uh, their, their method of fighting there was to pincer. In other words, you'd have three companies, A, B, and C. Able, Able Company for A, that's what I was in. B is Baker Company and C is Charlie Company. 
And uh, usually we uh, two, whoever uh, uh, we want to give some rest, uh, we would get our, uh, well, the real estate, you know what I call it, whatever, you know, capture it. And, but we were, we would uh, capture a hill. We'd have to uh, blast them out of there. And then when you capture that, then you're going to set up your main lines again. Then the one that needed it would get a rest, and you'd get it back for a couple of days to shower and uh, change your clothes and wash your clothes and get ready to go back up on the lines again and relieve. And that's the way we fought that war on Okinawa. So would you fight for four or five days in the front lines and then get a rest? Get a couple, a couple days. days rest? Yeah, clean your rifles and all that stuff. I was still teaching my boys how to clean rifles, yeah. Were you still a PFC? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, there was, ranks were not too much in the, uh, in the Marine Corps. When you were not on the front lines and you dropped back for your rest, where would you go? Was it like a base camp? Oh, we had a way back in the uh, captured territory. Uh, the what were the accommodations like there? Did you have barracks or were you still sleeping oh. on the ground? You can laugh on this one here. We bombed Naha Airport at that time. Naha? Naha, it was the capital city, and over on this uh, level spot, uh, they had uh, we we captured that. That's another part of the, my battle. That was a, quite a battle. We bombed it to make them useless for the, because the Japanese were only 90 miles away, and they could fly over and uh, fly over and uh, and uh, pull the banzai. I mean, not banzai, but the other one, the suicide uh, plane. They were suicide just like they do today, only they did it with the planes. They went down with two bombs and under to hit a ship, and that's why they, yeah. Well, and, and we dropped a lot of 500-pound bombs. I guess if you were yesterday, they had talking about 1,000 pounds all the way to the crater. Well, the air strips and all those craters, and they're full of water. I just set my my rifle down, took my bike off, and <laughs> closed and all, and then that was our swimming pool. There was a bunch of them all over there, <laughs> and we had uh, we had uh, soap, a bar of soap, and always in our uh, pack. It was uh, all-purpose soap. Uh, it was like an old octagon. It was a dark orange color, and uh, it was good for salt water or fresh water, and. Uh, then the next thing, we're skinny dipping there and all that. <laughs> Where did you sleep it? Then we uh, get, get a, uh, there's some foxholes, or you may uh, you have better protection way back. And uh, if there was a foxhole, yeah, I stayed in the foxhole all the time. Yeah, with a couple, another guy or stuff. So. Yeah. So you just, you just sleep in the ground in the foxhole? Right on the ground, yeah. Poncho, you had to like old raincoat. And, and, uh, well, you just, in the foxhole, all you do is you sit in there and you uh, just slide down. And all cat, cat naps. There was no such a thing as a... Real sleep. Every time you'd paw, uh, take the rest, you'd be sleeping. There. I mean, uh, sometimes you'd pause for, uh, take five, and they say take five, and for, cuddle up for a nap, fast nap. And I still do that today. I never got out of that. Never were, there, were there many casualties in your unit? Oh, it was a, it was a, I, I have no estimate of it, but I, I never, uh, I never was, uh, in other words, when I filled in at the Anton Airfield, I was put in uh, uh, my platoon, there isn't anyone that I could find that I started with. One time we were 60 of us. And we had to take uh, uh, two hills. And we were on there for three days. And there was 11 of us that did get wounded. And uh, that uh, uh, we come back off that the guy by the name of Pancho. I'm sorry, I never got his name. I didn't speak a little bit with him too long. And uh, I was teamed up with him when we when we buckled down in the foxhole. I stayed in the foxhole about three days or two days or whatever the battle. And 
one of his great ones was when we came back at the rest stop, somebody said, hey, Poncho, you still with us? And so Poncho said, oh, yeah, old Bush and I, uh, he says, uh, we keep our eyes open, we watch the bullets go by, and we don't see Poncho, we don't see Bush, or we let them go by. <laughs> but the sad part, the next day you got killed. When we back up on the lines, I got, uh, then I got my, uh, some of my training again, a flamethrower. And if you want to get attention on the front lines, put a flamethrower on your back. We got pinned down. Uh, it was you, a, you were the one that operated the flamethrower? Yeah, I, I learned it back here, and, uh, and I was just given in Camp and Pendleton. They asked me, I said, I wanted to learn everything. And I got to say, I got a good training. I got a good training. And the flamethrower, they don't use it no more, anymore. Uh, uh, in combat. I don't know what happened. I never did ask and I never did any. It was stopped before the Korea. A flamethrower is a, it's, it's a, mine was a double tank and uh, a GD to uh, uh, get instruction. In the tank is mixed with, uh, one tank is uh, gasoline and the other is napalm, which is a little thinner stuff. So that when it comes out and it hits you, the napalm enables the, the gasoline to stick right onto you. And the Japanese hated them. They were, oh boy. And uh, we got we come out on a little shelf. We were uh, a platoon of us. There was uh, 12 of us in the platoon, and that uh, 12 of us in the squad. I mean, in other words, uh, we broke into squads because we had a lot of territory to take and we grouped up. Anyway, uh, I had the flamethrower on. I didn't even get a chance to fire it. Oh, yeah, I did it one time. I went by one hole, and uh, and I give it a blast of uh, flames, and then another guy throws in a, a package of TNT, four pounds, and it has a pin, and you just throw it in. It's got seven seconds for it to go. A lot of us, all of us, uh, handle grenades, you uh, usually counted one, two, three, so you, you wouldn't get the thing coming back if they, somebody picked it up. You know, so Actually, you, you got four seconds to get it up there. So. Well, you throw that in, and usually it, it uh, caves uh, closed. So that gives us tell us, you know, it's closed. They can dig them open after, but at least it's closed. You won't have to worry about some sniper again. Anyway, uh, I had my flamethrower, and we come out onto a shelf, and uh, we got pinned down. They walked us into a trap. The first one they picked is the last one in, there, in the back of us. And so they started picking them off, and they got up to me, and I had fired uh, 13 shots. I, could, I don't know well, how I got through it. I got two bullets through my tank, and the stuff was running on my back. And um, uh, there were 13 shots fired at you. Yeah, I could feel them wanting to go, and I felt the one uh, that hit the tank on my back, and and uh, I could hear them. I what I could count, but it could have been more. And I, I, I told the, uh, the group down there, uh, uh, Robin and uh, the group, how I, uh, I, I said I'm laughing now, but I didn't want to get hit in the face. So at the last shot that went through the tank, I had my hand, got it, and I tipped my helmet over like that to block my <laughs> So I wouldn't get hit in the head, my <laughs> face. And they stopped firing at me, and then they went on to Pancho. And Pancho, uh, I heard that bullet today, I know it was pop. That's what it was. Pancho said, my name was on that one, Bush. And he, he was felt that far from there. We were pinned right down in his feet. I could see his shoes there. And, um, and he was joking right up to the end. Uh, we had a, a, a lieutenant got hit. We, were, we had a corporal in command by the name of Red Stavanovich. Now, I don't know anymore. He didn't get killed because I have a list of a lot of people who got killed. 
didn't get killed, but if anybody needed a, a, a bravery, because he got us down there. He had a white phosphorus grenade. White phosphorus is in a canister about this big around, about that high. And it's a grenade, but it burns phosphorus. That, that just falls onto you at six, and it burns right through. And, but it smokes. It's a smoke grenade. And it don't, it sparkles like uh, sparkling on, as you see on the 4th of July. And uh, and the wind was just blowing away and it covered us all up with smoke. And we able we were able to pull Poncho out. Now, we didn't have a blanket. Usually when a guy gets hit, he needs to be get warm. But, and if they're dead, we just throw a Poncho over them. So we, <laughs> we got somebody out of Poncho and... Get that away from me. He said, get that away from me. <laughs> he said, that's all we got. we got to get you out of here. I said, yeah, no. He said, I don't want to get wrapped up in that. He says, no. And the um, next morning they told us that he died that night in the hospital. Got him out, uh, pulled him out back out of the trap. And we pulled back to our regular line. And, uh, the next morning we got the bad news, but I wish never knew his name. No, he was from Me New Mexico. Yeah. You were hit 13 times. Were you wounded with any of those? No, times? no, none of them. No, no. That's crazy. Yeah. They went right they were going right over my back, and I couldn't get it. Why? Uh, there were only a couple shots went for the tank. I couldn't understand, but and then I think that tipping that helmet off on one shot there. Uh, uh, Stopped up fire in the meeting and went on to Pancho. Or whoever, wherever the snipers were. No way of finding them. When they got you pinned down, you, were, you, know, you wanted to get your head blown off, just move it. Yeah. But I, and I, I always said that there was somebody else with me. I always thought my mother, because she was a worried. She died because of that war. Really? Yeah, she had uh, six boys. Uh, six of us was in the service. In uh, World War Two and Korea War, yeah. yeah. And then I had my son and uh, went in Vietnam. Yeah. Were you awarded any medals or citations? No, it was on the right. We had the a presidential unit citation for the Battle of Okinawa. That was Harry Truman. It, uh, it's a uh, ribbon. I guess there's a medal to go with it, but I didn't. I, you have to go and. Follow the, I don't. I don't. Medal don't mean very much to me. And the other was uh, uh, for the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, it's the yellow one. The presidential unit citation is the bluish, which bright blue, blue color background. I think I could have uh, could have got a uh, what they call a uh, V mail. Uh, I when I got back to Guam, I touched them, told the family, but there was nothing I could tell them. There. What was the food like? It was a regular ration. They must have been happy to get back to real food. Uh, yeah, yeah, but um, it was just, uh, I I was poor when I was a. Uh, I brought it up in Depression time, upstate New York. My father was, uh, uh, we were on welfare because it, well, we didn't, uh, we, we took things that when the government would uh, give it out, they used to come from the government up there. Uh, government uh, had, uh, the word would get around in the village that they were they're giving out butter they're giving out uh, flour, they're giving out rice, they're giving out, uh, oh, I don't know. But we I, we could get, as kids, we could get, they would give us something. And we'd bring it home, my mother would do work, and then my father was a village blacksmith. And see, he, he even got paid about in uh, a duck or a turkey or something like that. Most of this uh, money, but he was put food on the table. Uh, so I wasn't, uh, when I went in there, uh, service and all, I, the first time I ever got full, uh, three meals a day. <laughs> How long were you on Okinawa before you got sent back to Guam? 
we stayed the whole battle. I was there uh, sometime in July. We went back to Guam. That was when the battle was done. I, a lot of uh, the last week was cleanups. That was a that was a horrible thing. The port civilians that got killed and uh, and suicide was unbelievable, unbelievable of the, the suicides that we watched with uh, one of the lieutenants and uh, we got together in a group because we saw some kids taking digging in the field, in the field on the on the bottom of the island here, uh, uh, there was uh, trees that were like tangled at, all through. And imagine that nature uh, did that for the uh, high, uh, you know, the typhoon out in that area, and they were they were all pushed to the ocean. Uh, all the civilians left and and. Uh, Wounded uh, Japanese and some, oh, probably uh, probably less than a thousand uh, soldiers that were wounded or just give up completely. Didn't want to commit suicide. So Japanese. Yeah, and then why, why uh, the other ones then we suicide? then then we I mean when we got back there, I, I'm putting myself a little bit too far. Before we got there, and we walked through a, uh, a road that didn't show. In the binoculars, we found that saw these two little kids go, and they were getting yams out of the garden. Over the yams and uh, sugar cane grew on that island, and they had a few vegetables there. And they were getting the yams; it was one of their main sti uh, staple out there. Yeah. Anyway, we walked in onto about 400 people and chaps, and men and women and Soldiers were taking a little grenade down about that high. Just, they just pull it and they grab each other and they hold it right over the cliff. And and they didn't it, want to be captured. And all the women that killed them too. And some, uh, some, I don't know if they're all civilians or uh, they had uh, Okinawan women there. They had uh, uh, their own uh, island uh, women. And uh, oh, they must have—I would say—40 to 50 suicides there. And his name is, uh, is uh, uh, I, I don't know if he's still alive now yet, but uh, he, uh, the lieutenant that we were with, George Thompson, is, uh, he saved us, I guess. We've got nine of us, there's 11 of us who got walked in, and we walked into a trap, and we're seeing all those, they come out of the... Uh, is it another time? This was a, this time on the end, well, on the same time, you know, they coming out and started committing suicide, they all hell broke loose. And they want they wanted uh, 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 smoke, smoke. Uh, my book says they said t tobacco. They only got a little touch in the book, a book I have, a book, and I was, uh, just a little touch of what went on there about that battle because uh, uh, Evidently, if they would have given uh, George Thompson a lieutenant, maybe if he would have got a citation or something, if there was somebody to uh, speak up for him, if he would have got a group of us so we could have told him what he did. He, he told us to break our cigarettes in half. And they went, tobacco, tobacco, smoke, smoke. And uh, all I remember was smoke, but the book says tobacco, tobacco. Yeah. So anyway, he was on a, he had a walkie-talkie. A big monster about this long, and he was on there. And he was calling for reinforcements that we were down in there, and we uh, seemed like a a lifetime. Finally, we got the troops coming in until we got equal, uh, you know, level of the playing field then and everything. So then came the big part of getting them out of there. Uh, the group that's out is the picture of them right in the book I got uh, in the green book. That I have the Battle of Okinawa. And this is one of the one that tells the truth about uh, everything. I can I can't find anything wrong with that uh, battle that they spell out there. Oh well, when you bring your stuff, I'd like to. Yeah, I'll bring it to you. Yeah. Did you do anything special for good luck? You know, 
Once in a while, so in between. <laughs> We got back to Guam and immediately we started preparing to invade Japan. Now this is one that that when uh, the day that they talk about uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Japanese celebrate it, no one thinks of what would ever happen to us. They talk about 90,000 people got killed in that bomb and they weep and everything. The people were in were fitted with bamboo sticks sharpened. A piece of bamboo, if you ever see how the bamboo shatters. And they're sharp and they'll go right through it. You know, they're, they're pointed. We were told that they would. They would ever, to the last man, we were, that's what we are going to expect. Our training, the training I was in, our, our company, we trained, uh, uh, the biggest one I remember was uh, B-25 bombers. If you gut them, take all the seats out in the, in the bomber, uh, they could get 80 of us in this, in on the floor, and we would sit there with our rifle between our legs and then our little our pack back, and we would sit on our, our pack, and we would drop out of the bomb bay. So what, we would hurry up and load up, go up with uh, the ladder get all in position, and then they would taxi the plane down to the end of the runway and turn around and come back. And then how fast it would unload. We'd unload this, boom, down that ladder, and about two steps and down there. And so uh, that was one day's training. That was to be done. Uh, parts of our uh, division were going to, our 20th were already on the ocean. We, we were ready to go in Japan. We were going to come in uh, after the uh, target airport. We were going to fly in and we were going to come out. And, and we said, boy, there's a lot of us going down 80 at a time because they got there. they got there in the aircraft and all that stuff. And no one knows it have been the biggest slaughter this uh, ever known. What division were you in? Six Marine Division. So uh, the good news came. Uh, in August, we were at a USO show sponsored by Gene Autry's troop, and, and uh, uh, one of his characters on there. Uh, see, I don't use the name that often there. Gabby, Gabby, Gabby Hayes. Gabby Hayes. He was uh, in control and. We were all laughing and laughed. Did you the show on Guam? Yeah, they have an outdoor theater. We, we call it a smoker. Uh, they have a smoker for it on Friday nights. Uh, they've been setting it up. And uh, a lot of amateur boxers of our own people. Frank was one of my buddies. He was an amateur bo boxer. He'll come up later. So they have a show, uh, an amateur boxer show? Oh, yeah. Show no, 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 no. We'd have the uh, three-round fights. That's what they were. They, and they'd bang the hell out of each other. And, <laughs> and we'd have uh, probably, uh, probably about six or eight. Or, it all depends on how many you can get to fight. That's all. They wanted to get the loose to it. Huh? Yeah. Frank was a light, lightweight, and he was a hometown hero down in uh, Queens uh, in Long Island. And uh, I'll bring him up on the, later here by we talk. And anyway, yeah. Uh, so the news came over. We interrupt your program for a very important message from the United States government. Our planes have just dropped a bomb on, what is the first one, Nagasaki? And they had the power of a 40 carloads of TNT. Unbelievable, you could think of because you handle four pounds of TNT, and these are railroad cars full of that. They, they use that for, I don't know, stayed up there all of the register. 
and it was all silent, and all of a sudden they all started clapping, clapping. Boy, oh boy. This is what we need. And that same week, uh, uh, they hit the other one that time. And then the process was uh, that uh, Japan surrendered. That means we're going home. But that wasn't where we were going yet. We had some more work to do. We were invited by Cheyenne Kai-shek. He was at that time. Now the war started up again. The Chinese were fighting the communists and the Japanese in Asia over there. And he invited, that's what he told us, you know, they, a group of the armor division over to uh, our section where Tsingtao, China. It's Can you not that. T S I N G T O E. Sing, you, Sing Tower or something like that. Like that. Ching Tower. Today it's no longer Sing Tower. It's Quang. Quang. I don't. I got this second handed. They changed the big cities all in. This was a summer resort. We were in there. We were going up to. To. Uh, shipped right out from Guam. We, China? Yeah, we, six, uh, we yeah, but we got in on, on the way in. We got into the China Sea, the East China Sea. And we hit a typhoon. There was about four thousand of us aboard that ship, packed in there like raft, like sardines. They were telling us forty foot waves from the typhoon. That boat would go just like this, boom, boom, and you'd all get charged. We were all. That's pretty scary. I don't know. I, I've, been, I, I, I've talked to myself time and time again. I, what was I doing? I was. That I, but I, we were not that scared. I guess we were so revved up when the war was over. We were going to go to China. A lot of a lot of guys uh, could go home, but they, but they said we'll never get a chance to go to China, so they came with us. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, Frank did that too. Here he is. He hadn't seen his kid. Ever never saw his kid. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to get that one. I'll tell you that one later. What uh, my relationship with him. Anyway, uh, we finally got through with this spot. It was another one in a lifetime. But I think we're about six or eight hours. We got out of the typhoon, and then uh, we landed in Tsingtao, China, and uh, we were uh, we stayed out. We didn't get off ship till four days later. We're still on ship. We just come up and we could watch the sandpans and all that. Uh, uh, the crooks down there uh, <laughs> selling stuff already. <laughs> anyway, we pulled in there and there was a big, big, uh, big banner across. Uh, welcome, General Shepard. He was our commanding officer, the general. And so we went up to a, uh, a university. And some universities. We were housed up there. All the Japanese stayed in there, and then we came in, and we could, and I don't know if we got the same mattresses or what, but don't matter when you, but all of us six-footers, we, we just fit in all the bunks were six-foot. <laughs> Anybody over that, they hang over there. Anyway, I only stayed there a couple of days, and I got a call from the, from the, uh, our Sergeant. He was a gunnery sergeant by the name of Falzones from Massachusetts, somewhere right there. Wanted to see me down to his office. Well, I said, what the heck we got here? I was I was ready because we were scheduled to go north, and our platoon was uh, to, uh, going to guard the railroad tracks against the communists. My mail to to sun their way. But it's just waiting to come through, but if you know the politics and everything. They, we were going there as guests. Like heck, we were up there to hold up that war so they could get into uh, out of there or get you know uh, fight them better or whatever. He was losing ground anyway. Anyway, uh, let's see now. I went down to see the sergeant. Went in there and you know, hello and. Sit down, Bush. He says, uh, we're putting a, a brig detachment together. Prisoners, he says, and I want you to represent me over 
as a guard or whatever they got for you over there. I, I got to get one man and you're my man. Jeez, I said to him, I just got to know these guys, Sergeant, from some of my was on Okinawa with and everything, and everything was good, and I wanted to stay here. He said, Bush, I'm telling you, your commanding officer, by Olin L. Beal, he was a major. He take, he's in, he's a, he is the company commander of the, of the MP battalion, and, and this brig detachment will be a detachment of the, of the, the military police. And I, and I didn't just pick this out of a hat. He said, you'll get treated good and everything. He said, I'll tell you, I like you, boy. <laughs> Took the wind right out of my sails. <laughs> he did me feel like that. I walked out of there and never forgot that. Never saw him again either. He went north and I don't know what happened. But they say, you want, sometimes somebody watches you, you know, you don't know who it is. And, and, uh, so anyway, I went down there. I wasn't sorry after a while. I was just one other guy over where I was supposed to at headquarters down in this big hotel along the beach there. And uh, I found a guy by the name of John Bowles from Forest Park, uh, Georgia. That's the suburbs of Savannah all around. Forest Park. Yeah. It's a, it's a group just like... Uh, Avon is a part of Hartford, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so well, what happened, they uh, said I was a carpenter. I did have industrial arts in high school. He knew uh, there was some work to be done. So we all, I knew how to hammer and nail and saw and everything. And John had the same thing. So he and I started with what we had. We had no prisoners. We were to get uh, what the supervision of a, a Lieutenant uh, Smith, from, he was from Georgia, he makes a night for John Bowles, too, he is, uh, so anyway, hell of a nice guy, good guy, big tall guy, anyway, uh, we got in there, and then after about a week we worked, we got some cells together, and what we had to do was put together a holding, holding uh, uh, room for political prisoners. What we uh, these uh, what they you see in, in uh, over in uh, in Iraq, well, how they handle uh, prisoners that are uh, did uh, atrocities to their, uh, their that's the way it works. And so we uh, wound up we got uh, some Chinese carpenters. Uh, well, I didn't get them, but they were in the process of getting them. With, and so they took over doing all the hammer and nails and they put together and uh, just uh, things over the windows and rooms that was all around in the back up there anyway so they put us so that we could handle prisoners and uh, they wouldn't get away with it and so we got 13 Germans they were uh, it was a city that that back in the late 1800s they landed out there as a you know, that was, that was like Europe. They went around. They'd be a colony. Here. So, Tsingtao uh, had a lot of German people, and they were all uh, educated. Uh, they had their own uh, priorities and everything, whatever. So, uh, we had two two Japanese uh, officers. I don't know what they were officers anyway, and we had them put into. Uh, they were high. Uh, we had to make sure we didn't lose them. So there was something there. Uh, yeah, and we had so we housed the uh, 13 Germans in the room, one big room, with beds in there. And uh, it was just funny for the place. This room was a root cellar, out from the hotel up there, a root cellar. No lights uh, in it or anything, just the door, and it was in the room. So. Uh, the, Intelligence asked us. We had a solitary cell or something. We showed him that one. He said, "That's good enough for him." You know? <laughs> we put him in there, and I laugh at it now, though. And I think, like, but John Bowles and I, we got two two mattresses, and we put, give them both a bucket to have, but they weren't going to get out. And, out there, and, uh, 
they have to do their business. They have to do it in the bucket. And we, they said, don't make it easy on them. And we said, we'll take care of it and everything. They, we used to open the door at noontime, give them a half a loaf of bread. They got the, uh, uh, ever hear bread and water for prisoners? Uh, we used to laugh. We give them a half a loaf of bread and all the water they can drink. <laughs> So uh, every third day we had to chase them. I would chase them and guard them, take them which, uh, to a uh, mess hall, and they got something to eat in the line. They sat over in the corner, and everybody knew it. And John Bowles would do it. It seemed like a long time, but uh, it was probably about three weeks we had them. But we'd open them up at noon to let them out, and they'd come out, no lights in there, nothing, just completely dark coming her eyes and they stand by the door and it took them about five minutes before they could accustom them there. And um, when they finally intelligent us when they got them there, they, they, they didn't, uh, they just took them from us. And, and anyway, you have to interrogate them. They, they have to, when they come out there, they saw that what we were doing, but they, they were satisfied with it. We had Germans, we had white Russians. We didn't have any Chinese. Chinese took care of all their own. Uh, they were they arrested a lot of uh, those, uh, I don't know what they call them, I forgot the word they used. I know that they uh, worked with the enemy. The Japanese were there. How long did you stay in China? Uh, nine months. China was uh, when it came to uh, we were had so many points for uh, time and combat time and uh, you got so many points and so we, the ones with the highest points went first and so that started uh, let's see the war was over in August in February and some some loose ones some of the first ones the one or two had uh, they had uh, the end of their four-year enlistment, so they went right off. Well, well, some of them wanted to go anyway, even after they wanted to go to China anyway. But they had enough. Of it. Anyway, uh, in so May, we're going to go right home and be discharged. Oh, I'm going to go to go right to uh, um, San Diego. That's where I shipped out of. Although my last training was in Pendleton, up to uh, 20, 40 miles up the coast. Do you remember your last day in service over in China before you came home? Uh, that uh, my, my service record uh, would show when I got aboard the ship. That would be yeah. uh, I got Then when I got on the ship, we had to go up to a port. That, uh, it, today is Beijing. Then it was Tinsing. And uh, ten, uh, at Beijing and then Tinsing and... Uh, Tinian or something like that. Two big cities up there aside. They're a different name today, so nobody knows that much about that. Anyway, the, the, the port was uh, Baku, and we anchored out there, and they came with a boatload of uh, of uh, Marines to pick up, and there was a couple of three of them. Oh, so, uh, half a dozen of my buddies. Boy, did we have an old day there. Yeah. And uh, one of the funny things about uh, getting on that ship uh, roll call. As soon as ready to, to leave, they give out the roll call, and they went through. And they went by this. It, I, I I didn't know. It didn't matter to me then at the time. And it was Musto, a kid. And uh, anyway, that's the hell with me here. It's gone. So they pull anchor, and we started. And then we headed for the, for the, for Hawaii. That's what we didn't know where we were going. We we're going home, but. Anyway, but at that time, then the next day when they give a roll call again in the morning, they kind of, but the sergeant says, Manasu, from Muso. And it just happened to be a kid next to me. And there was something that tracked in Plasper, New York. And I say, hey, are you from Plasper? Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm from Keyswell. And I said, we'll go home together, maybe. Huh? So Muso. So anyway, he said, geez, if I can get out of here. He said, I ain't hunting a list. I didn't on the list. So I said, well, 
He said, I said, they won't turn around and bring you back there. Don't be worried about it. But go tell your sergeant. Tell him that he didn't recall your name. So I went with him. I sunk over with you. And so the sergeant took the list, and he comes down to, and Musso said, there it is right there. He said, Manasu. No, no, it's Musso. He said, <laughs> you know that. He never corrected it. On the next day would be Manasu and Musa <laughs> uh, Yo. Anyway, so we uh, landed in Guam just to, just to pick up some more uh, Marines going home. And we landed in Guam. We stayed there. Oh, we had steak uh, five times a day. <laughs> they wanted us to re enlist, you know. Uh, but no, I'm going to go home. So all Marines. East of the Mississippi would go to Bainbridge, Maryland, and all the Marines west of the Mississippi would be discharged right there at San Diego. That's uh, that's the decision made. And so, um, on the way, we uh, we left on uh, on a train, troop train, and uh, I think it was the second day. One, uh, well, the time probably about 60 hours or so. We were in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, outside is when we got in the train wreck. And it was all Marines on the train? Yes, the train all 208 Marines. And uh, those, uh, those, the sheets will uh, be a uh, news clipping and uh, I'll say, uh, we'll say two Marines, but no address is given. Two. That's always released in, uh, of the names. The, the Major, when we got into the train wreck, and we, I went up for observation for a, a, a concussion of the side of my head, and there was about 30 of us in the bus. We took them, and all the others, uh, not 30, about 20. And there was another uh, 10 or 15 that uh, had all burns from steam. How many Marines died? Uh, I, they're, 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 they give two. But I know five, and I, and I said there was what I saw. There was ten of them, at least. This this here now here's what what it is here. What the and you have to you, with the train wreck, how we came around the curve and the, and the, and the, later on, later there's some of this stuff I found out later. But I talked to two. I was helping guys out of the train, and there was two uh, railroad men uh, who were standing there. And he said it had been raining for three days, and the Susquehanna River has swollen over, and it undermined the, the bedding of the railroad track. And we come this curve, the engine went right into the, uh, the, the. You have to see some of the rails all twisting in there, and went right into the ground. Behind there was a boxcar where all our sea bags were in, sailed right over and the smokestack must have ripped the whole side over and it shows, the picture shows that, I had my kid make a big picture like that of it, better about the side. And you can see the little dots where if you know what it is, it's sea bags. And our car, I was on the left window like that, and our car went right over like this. We went flying, all of us on up there. We were all injured, I mean, uh, banged up. They landed on a rupture in the steam that when the window came through the window. My fun friend uh, Frank, who I took out, I got him out the first one. I, I, when I got a hold of myself, I was out in the aisle. It was full of steam. You couldn't see. I, could, I recognized Frank. He was on his hands and knees. I don't know how I reckon. I think I think I saw his name, Rizzo, because I didn't couldn't see by his face. I didn't look at his face. And I got him, was able to get him up to the door. And uh, at the time, I I could uh, I claimed I carried him out myself. I know I had him on my back. But when I saw the pictures here just a few years ago, and my kids were able to get on the internet, uh, I said I can't tell anybody that even now, because I I couldn't get him off on my back six feet in the air. I can't tell that story. I can't tell it. And then uh, I was able to find out, uh, find a guy. I had a 
my kids helped me because they did all this work I could of uh, uh, we had a, a a newsletter that our six division strike newsletter that comes out as a member and we get information and then in there it says uh, can we help and I looked and I and I had been, had been about six years in there but it's a, it's a uh, SOS. It's a SOS. And I looked at the nature of the letters in there. I used to just look for names to see if I recognized the name, but I didn't read all of them. Boy, I got a hold of my son there. I said, uh, hey, there's my answer right there. If I can put it in there, I mean, these people are getting responding. I will find them, find the guys, the guys that I was with. So you ought to see when you put in my, I show the, I'll bring you a newsletter to show you. That's when I was nice circle right. I got about a uh, response between telephone calls about 15 Marines. All names, addresses, and phone numbers were on that train with me. So did you figure out from Oh, then the things started falling in place. When I, when I had Frank up to the door, I jumped down on the ground, and a guy by the name of, uh, of uh, uh, Jack Houston and um, Musso, my friend Musso, put him on my back put uh, this Frank Rocco, Frank Rizzo, his name is Frank. Rizzo. Rizzo. And he's from, uh, he was at the, his home address was in the, the Queens section of Long Island. And we had a lot of plans that we were going to do and he'd see his kid now. And I had him on my back and I walked over the next track and on the, just over the other track, the main track, it was a little shelf like along the railroad track, about that high. And I brought Frank up and I had him out of my back. He was about 160 pounds. It was, and I put him down like that, and I, that was a shock. His face was completely cooked. Eyes open, open. They were gray balls. He was alive. And he started to out and mud with blood. He had all burned his inside of his mouth and all like that. And, uh, and I said to somebody, take care of them. And, and so I went back on the train, and uh, I went down, and I slid down. It must be like this. I'm like, and you could, it was a hard job getting those guys out. And I, I, you know, I, was, I, I could carry it, help a lot. And I, finally the steam was starting to stop. You know, it was coming up. And the guys were all, their backs were showing. It was all wet with the steam and everything it was just and then I looked out through the door and I saw the I saw the boxcar come through the door and I saw the swollen river where I was right close to the river like that down that whole side of that bank but the pictures don't show it because it, and that's all we can get is these uh, these were done by the some historical society anyway so anyway to get back to the southern if you take uh, a bun, uh, a pan, but buns, you know how they, uh, all little buns. Yeah. That's all they can see, all bundled up, all the guys' backs. Some of them with broken backs, broken legs, cooked, and, and all that stuff. And there's no information on this at all. I doubt very much the way this was covered up. It's covered up. I, I don't think I could do it any better than what I did of getting the information here than the way what my son's through the internet. I put it to, and then he, uh, and, and then Jack took care of uh, Frank because he, he wrote to me, he called it, it looked like a cooked chicken. That's all he, he, he had his own way. I didn't want, I just, in your own words, you know, like uh, in your own words and you get, you get the best. Then, uh, then uh, uh, we stayed in the hospital up in uh, Air Force. It was uh, it's no longer there. Middleton Air Force Base. Some of the one of the guys is uh, in a group that you now knows what I was talking about. Uh, he's an Army man, but it was, it's an Army base there, Air Force. And then we. We got to Bainbridge, Maryland on the 29th. That's when I got discharged. 
there was nothing to it at the boom and uh, because uh, 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 May 1946 yeah. my discharge will show that and where did you go home to New York? then we started for home no, and we rode the train to New York and I said no more I ain't gonna I said no. so anyway I said I don't want to stay on I think that rumbling and all that I'm just a, so anyway, we changed our mind and we uh, got another train from Albany. I'm from New York to Albany. This time I said, no way. I said that I was with this um, Musso. He was going to Flashburg. I said, look, we'll get a place in the USO here. 25 cents, you, uh, 50 cents, you can get in and get a shower. And we'll, in the morning, I said, we'll get out there. It's Memorial Day the next day, that day, and we'll hitchhike. And the people want to know about them. They see us in uniform, they will go. <laughs> so uh, it worked good. First car come along on Albany. We were right on Route 9, rode to Sar uh, Schenectady, I mean uh, Saratoga Springs. And we stopped four or five times on our way up. They bought us beer, and then uh, we got home uh, all, uh, before dark. Wow. Yeah. What did you do for a career after? Uh, that's when I uh, see I had a job promised in Bristol Brass in Bristol so I came back I stayed home for uh, three weeks Bristol Brass? yeah that's in Bristol and is that what you did for your career for the rest of your life? no, you no I, uh, I got active in the labor movement United Auto Workers and uh, I was president of my union at Bristol Brass. And I played a little politics. Um, we were, Ella Grassa was running for uh, Secretary of State. And uh, I said, she's the girl to do it. She'll do a good job for you. We, so we, I had a commitment of everybody in my union, 400 of them, to vote for her. I, I, and I had a, um, a coffee and donut at the plant gate and a little publicity with the Bristol Press and all and when she come down opening I did the same thing with Toby Moffat too I, when he ran as, as secretary of the not secretary of state but a congressman I know how it worked anyway uh, and things went on I attended when she was there and I went to high mic and all I thought and finally one day in, uh, in, uh, the commissioner who was a UAW man, jumped the fence and went to work for Scovels, and then the, the deputy commissioner at uh, the Labor Department was promoted as commissioner, and so uh, we had enough, we had a good uh, good uh, support for, uh, for Ella, and so my director said that the job should be filled by a UAW man, and so he put my name in the basket, and she, when I got the call over there, she appointed me a deputy labor commissioner. In Connecticut? Yeah. You were the deputy labor commissioner? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You moved to Connecticut from New York? I'm old. No, no. Oh, I, I forgot. I was in all this time here, I'm telling you. I'm, I was working in the brass mill, and I was uh, working union work, too, and building up uh, with politics and all, run, a, run for town. I, uh, Avon is a Republican town, that's all. Well, you, you lived in Avon, Connecticut then? Yeah, uh, I was living in, the uh, first time I lived in Bristol, and then I got married in 1949. And so I moved out to Avon, and built right next to where my wife lived. And how many kids did you tell me you had? Four. I didn't put down kids on there, but, but yeah, four boys. Boys. Yep. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, I was stayed with uh, my um, division. I attended some. I attended some uh, re re uh, retirement group. Uh, not retirement. Reunions? Reunions. That's my next question. Yeah. So you said it's the sixth division striker. Uh, striking six is the uh, is the title of our. Uh, Newsletter. Striking? Yeah, six? striking. Striking six. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? 
Yes, it's always been there. It's always been there. I, I, uh, that, uh, I don't know what I would have done now if she didn't get me out of that. I got my story out now, and I, 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 uh, I got somebody to believe me. And, uh, because uh, it's impossible to... Uh, if the newspapers even said that the, even right there with the picture, the little bit of news they had said the engine toppled it in the canal. And they talk about got two of those two guys got scalded. How can you get scalded when the engine's in the river, out of the river? But it don't matter. They put it in there, and somebody picks it up. Okay, but but it's local, and there's no big news down there unless there's a, one of them uh, lived in Harrisburg. Maybe it would be out. But that's how, it, how it, this uh, by not releasing names. It stayed right in Harrisburg, this wreck. It was just another wreck. That's all. Frank's name never shows in no place. Yeah. And no address is given. I, I point that out, how effective it was then. And why I could not, when I filed claims for my hearing, that uh, they fabricated a medical... Exam, a physical examination with information I gave to them that I didn't remember when I was hit my side of my head and all, and were able to shove it down my throat because I couldn't prove it. They had it down there. I told them I wanted the, the medical report at, at uh, Bainbridge, Maryland, but the medical exam I got was, uh, was at that Air Force but the day before. So they put down on the medical report the 28th. I wasn't there in Bainbridge on the 28th. I was up in Pennsylvania on the 28th in a train wreck. Now I've appealed it in there, appealed it in there. They gave me, uh, I got 40% disability in my hearing. But I still say that the, because the medical report that they had showed me that with no, nothing when I do discharge, which well, used against me, and I probably probably have 60 or 70 today. Uh, I, presume. I can appeal every two years, but that's what they did to me there, and they fabricated things in there with a complete, complete lies and, and uh, being secret. That's why today now somebody gets killed. It's in the night paper. None of that stuff has uh, happened in World War II. I think you've got it pretty well, if, uh, and then I can uh, help you out with some pictures and things, what I was talking about. And then you'll be able to grab it better. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for sharing with me, Mike. Mm -hmm. well, otherwise, I've been happy to uh, do it uh, just for the sake of Frank and uh, the guys that uh, didn't get that publicity. One thing, another thing that bothers me, is some of it's me. I, I'm a fighter, and I... Just to, I got into fights protecting somebody, I, and, 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 uh, and I was brought up that way because big family. I come from a family of 14, uh, nine boys and uh, five uh, girls. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm the oldest now, <laughs> there, but there's only three of us left. <laughs> yeah. So that, with all those things in the background, uh, but I knew what it was to fight, to eat, and all that. Uh, yeah.